scripture. When thinking about freedom and deliverance in light of God's glory, we turn to David's words in the book of Psalms, chapter 27, verses 1 through 4 and verses 11 through 14. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies, do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen again against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the, hand of the, in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tracy. I believe God wants us to wrestle with messy, real-life situations, and that's what we have been doing these past five weeks as we've been looking at different uh, movies and the situations that they present, even with the Hollywood spins uh, that are in play. What are the lessons to be learned as we have looked at some of these um, movies? You know, Jesus did the same thing in his day. Do you realize that Jesus was always speaking about social, political, and historical events? He did it for three years. In John 9, what about the man who's born blind from birth, Jesus? Who has sinned? Was it the man himself who sinned or his parents? that he was born blind. In Matthew 22, tell us, Jesus, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? In Luke 7, now Jesus, if you are a prophet, how would it be that you would allow this woman of sin to touch you, to anoint your feet with alabaster oil, letting her hair letting your, her tears wash them, and drying your feet with her hair. In Luke 13, when told that Pilate had murdered some Galileans while they were worshiping in Jerusalem, mixing their blood with the blood of the sacrifices on the altar, Jesus would pose this question. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than other people from Galilee? Is that why they suffered? And in the very next verse, Jesus says, And what about those 18 in Jerusalem the other day? The ones crushed and killed when the Tower of Siloam collapsed and fell on them. Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? Or how about John 4? When thinking about racism as we are today, what was Jesus doing when he spoke to a sinful woman, a despised Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in Sychar? Do you know the Jews in his day, when traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, would never take the direct north-south route through Samaria? They would take a 40-mile detour, cross the Jordan River, and not cross back until they were well south of Samaria and due east of Nazareth. That's hatred. And that's what blacks faced, especially in the south in 1965. Even though the Civil Rights Act passed a year earlier, the same year that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 
He was 35 years old when he received that award and would be assassinated four years later on April 4th, 1968. The movie Selma picks up in 1963. There's been a church bombing in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, where four precious little girls are killed. Then we see a woman by the name of Annie Lee Cooper, played by Oprah Winfrey. She's going to attempt to vote in Selma, Alabama, where she was born. She had moved away over the years and had been registered to vote in Pennsylvania and Ohio, but in 1962, she had moved back to Alabama to care for her elderly mother. Watch how things worked when you tried to vote in that state. That attempt to register to vote in front of that registrar got her fired from her nursing home job, just as he said it might. She then went to work as a motel clerk. She's best known, Annie Lee Cooper, for punching Selma Judge Jim Clark in the jaw after he prodded her in the back of her neck with a billy club. Annie Lee Cooper lived to be a hundred years old. In this next scene, now it's January 1965, Martin Luther King Jr has met with President Lyndon Johnson, who tells him the time is not ripe now to address the voting problem, that King will have to wait, that he's working on a new program, the War on Poverty. King tells him that he can't wait, and the stage is set for the Civil Rights Movement and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the S. CLC to move into action targeting Selma, Alabama, whose population was over 50% black with less than 2% of the population of that population registered to vote. There's going to be a meeting of the SCLC leadership in Selma, but the night before King travels there, Martin can't sleep. He is so troubled for what lies ahead. So he calls his dear friend, Mahalia Jackson, in the middle of the night. She would later be known as the Queen of Gospel. The little ticker tape, the FBI is is tuning in to every move that uh, Martin Luther King makes and is bugging every phone line that he uses. There will be three marches from Selma to Montgomery. It's a 54-mile march to the state capital in Montgomery. But before the first one, there was the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson in we're going to be looking about a, at a, about a six-month period in the first six months of 1965. So this is going to occur on February 18th, 1965. And that kind of sets things in motion. Jimmy Lee Jackson was a 26-year-old activist and deacon in his Baptist church. 500 people left an evening prayer service at the Zion Methodist Church in nearby Marion, Alabama, on a peaceful march to Perry County Jail, where the young Reverend James E. Orange was being held. They had planned to sing hymns and return to church that night. Governor George Wallace had got wind of the march and planned to make a forceful statement. He brought in the Alabama State Troopers and authorized all the streetlights to go out upon command. The protesters were severely beaten, including a UPI, a United Press International photographer, with his cameras smashed, and NBC correspondent Richard Valerani was hospitalized. Jimmy hurried into the Black Max Cafe with his mother and 82-year-old grandfather, hoping that 
the troopers would not follow, but three did. When Jimmy tried to protect his mother, one trooper threw him against a cigarette machine. A second trooper shot him twice in the abdomen. The state trooper, James Fowler, that was found to have been the one to pull the trigger, um, was never indicted by a grand jury. In fact, he was transferred to Birmingham, Alabama and promoted, saying he never got so much as a letter of reprimand. So then we come to these three marches. Now we're not going to show them. The first one is so very painful to watch. The first one occurred on March 7th, 1965, on what's been called Bloody Sunday. State troopers and county posse men attacked the 600 unarmed marchers with billy clubs and tear gas after they crossed the county line. The second march, which occurred two days later on March 9th, was really just a symbolic march because King decided not to go against a federal court injunction. So they crossed the now famous Edmund Pettus Bridge. Martin Luther King nailed, kneeled down to pray. All the people watched him and they too kneeled down to pray and they got up, turned around and went back to church. The third march occurred on March 21st and ended on March 24th. Governor George Wallace refused to protect the marchers, but President Johnson allowed the march and sent in 2,000 U.S. Army soldiers and 1,900 National Guardsmen to protect them. 25,000 people from all over the country, uh, white and black, marched peacefully. The third march ended at the Alabama State Capitol in Montgomery. Let's watch its end and President Ad uh, Johnson addressing the nation. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord from the battle hymn of the Republic. As I reflected back on this movie, one of the greatest stories of redemption to come out of the voting rights drama was in the person of George Wallace. As reprehensible of a figure to come out of that era as there was. He served four terms as Alabama's governor, once preceded his own wife. He ran for president four times. With his fiery racial, racial rhetoric at his first inaugural speech as governor in 1963, he shouts, Segregation now! Segregation tomorrow! Segregation forever! A year later, he makes national news by standing at the doorway of the registrar's office at the University of Alabama trying to halt National Guardsmen who were there to help enroll the school's first two black students. At a 1972 presidential campaign rally, he was shot and paralyzed from the waist down and would be in a wheelchair the rest of his life and in constant pain. Then in 1978, it's said that he had a born-again experience. And from that moment on, he sought to face-to-face -face, forgive as many people as he had heard as possible, starting with black civil rights leaders. During his final term as governor, from 83 to 87, he made a record number of black appointments to state positions, including for the first time two black members in the same cabinet. He died at the age of 79 in 1998. Remember how Johnson said, we won't live to 1985? Well, Johnson didn't. He died in 1973. At his funeral, an estimated 25,000 mourners, nearly as many blacks as whites, walked slowly past his coffin that lay in state. Tim Roth, who played Wallace in the movie, grew up during the Civil Rights era, and he remembers Wallace as saying how amazed he was during portions of his life at what came out of his mouth. 
He said, I was a monster. Wallace once said that the constant pain that he had following that assassination attempt was God's way of reminding him of all the pain he had caused earlier in his life. So guess who was supposed to deliver his funeral eulogy? Billy Graham, who was too sick to do it, so Franklin, his son, gave it. And Franklin is quoted as saying, picking up on what George Wallace said at that inaugural, first inaugural speech, he said, Jesus Christ today, Jesus Christ tomorrow, Jesus Christ forever. I don't know how many of you saw this Time Magazine front cover picture a couple of weeks ago. It says, America, 1968, and it's crossed out in, 19, in 2005, is written in, what has changed, what hasn't? History has a way of making, of casting a better light on people. Martin Luther King, for many of us, was seen just as J. Edgar Hoover, in the movie, called him, said he was a, a communist, a rabble-rouser, an evil person who incites people. I don't know where I was in my mind and during that time. I'm embarrassed to know. I knew what was happening, but I didn't really enter into that chapter of history. But we sure look at Martin Luther King different today than we did in 1965. And today we have a black president, we have black superintendents of schools, black mayors, black police chiefs, and that's progress. That's significant progress. But then there's Ferguson, and Cleveland, and New York, and Baltimore, and we see riots again, and looting again, and cities burning again. But our faith is relational. It's based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the closer we are to Jesus Christ on an intimate basis, the better our lives are. And I would say that's the way the whole world sh should operate in relationship. The better we're in relationship with one another, the better government operates the better police departments operate, the better families operate, schools operate. The more we come into harmony with each other, peace and shalom and strength comes. For police, it may, it may take the form of body cameras, but I believe the things that work best are the relational things, like community-oriented policing and civilian oversight and citizens review. All of that can be done without weakening departments or perceptions of police who must always be in control. Police, my friends, must always win if we're going to have a semblance of control. They have to win the battles. So I go back to Franklin Graham's quote. And he was actually paraphrasing Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ in relationship with the world and with us individually. Today, Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. Tomorrow, Jesus Christ, my hope and my Redeemer forever. Amen.